Good morning and welcome to worship. Today is a very special day in the calendar for Christians as we come aside to contemplate the death of our Lord as we remember what he did for us as a people. And wherever you are joining us from this morning, we want to welcome you and to assure you that God is here and God is with you. Let's take a few moments just to pause and to reflect on his goodness. John writing says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. As we continue to worship this morning, we're going to sing, Hallelujah, my Father, for giving us your son. thanksgiving in our hearts and with praise. We cannot begin to contemplate or imagine what you allowed your son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go through for us. But we are here as evidence of his grace and his mercy, his love that was shown, and his willingness to forgive those who harmed him. We thank you that he has blazed a new path so now we can truly say we are children of God because we've been called and reconciled to our Father. And as we've come together this morning across our globe to contemplate, reflect, and give thanks, we pray that your living word will speak into our hearts and reveal to us the depth of your love and help us to recognize the responsibility that comes with that love as we receive it, to share it. 
And so, gracious Father, we just ask that you would forgive us where we fail you time and time and time again. And help us to arise from that place of dereliction and marginalization and move towards you again. We thank you that we can come as your people. And we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed the one who has broken down the dividing wall. And we ask now as we continue to wait before you and to reflect that your spirit of truth will reveal more of who you are to us. Hear our prayers and have mercy upon us. For we ask all these things for your glory and your kingdom's sake. Amen. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and help us not to fall into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We welcome those from St. Germain and Christ Church who are sharing with us this morning and my colleague Sarah will be bringing the word later on. Lottie is going to lead um, the singing with JJ and Dixie. And together, wherever you are this morning, let me assure you that your God is with you. God is right here with us this morning. He died to save all of mankind and to bring healing and hope. And so as we join together in praise and thanksgiving, let's just wait before him. We're going to listen to our reading this morning. and We're going to ask um, John to come and read to us right now. The reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 19. The Crucifixion of Jesus. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, Knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, 
put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. All that is needed for our salvation was completed there at Calvary. And one of the most startling things that Jesus said was, Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. But then if you go back to when he entered Jerusalem and he said, if you, only you, knew what was meant for your peace, I wonder where you are today. Mark is going to lead us with J.J. and Dixie in some songs this morning. Let's just join as we reflect on these songs. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope, and hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain.
He is worthy. Worthy to receive all our praise and all honor and all glory. We're going to spend some time in prayer. And as we draw near to him, we need to recognize the worldwide perspective. Jesus didn't come for any one particular group, but he came for all mankind. And he was very, very much involved in the lives of the people of his day. And he has called us to be involved in the lives of the people around us wherever we are. This pandemic has affected the whole world. Families, individuals. It has affected the way we have been worshipping, but it has also revealed to us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we have found new ways of expressing our worship to God. So let's draw near to him in prayer this morning. We come to you this morning, Father, as those that you have called and placed in families and homes and communities and cities, countries, within the world to be light and salt. This morning as we come, we are very mindful of the impact that this virus is having across our world. We want to pray for South America at this time, and in particular for Brazil. And Father, we ask that you would speak into the heart and the mind of the president and all those who are in authority, that they may recognize what's happening and take effective measures to combat this disease. You have made a way. You have opened the minds of scientists to create a vaccine. And Lord, I pray that there will be, Father, equitable distribution across the world irrespective of our ability to pay. You are the giver of life and of hope and we pray Lord for the people who are living in situations that are hopeless at this time. We pray that you'll move the hearts and the minds of those who are in authority to take the necessary steps so that their lives Lord might begin to change. Father we look around our world we think of Myanmar at this moment and we see the devastation that's taking place. It hasn't been that long when the people have been ravaged by war and, and vicious atrocities. Oh Lord, we know that it is only when we come to you and find you as our Lord and our Savior that we will be able to respond accordingly. And so we pray for those in authority there, Lord. We pray that you would speak into their hearts and open their eyes so that they'll begin to act justly. We bless your name, Father, for your grace and your mercy and your patience in the way you deal with us. And we ask that you might help us to be likewise. We pray for those children in Syria, in families who are separated. Lord, we pray that you will minister to them, for those in Eritrea, for those in Ethiopia. Lord, we look around our world and our hearts are breaking when our world could make a difference if only we had the courage to act there could be such a difference open our hearts Lord help us not to be silent as your church and also be willing to move to take action we pray for your church we pray that father that there will be unity that there will be a genuine expression of your love within us, among us, and to those round about us. We pray that that love that calls you to come and walk the way of Calvary and lay down your life, Lord Jesus, that it will be evident in our lives, reaching out and ministering to those who are in need. Especially today, Lord, the prophet Isaiah reminds us that by your stripes we are healed. We pray for those who are sick, in body, in mind, and spirit. We pray that your hand will be extended to bring healing and hope. 
We pray for broken families and broken homes. Lord, we pray that you would come to them. We see the number of families who are struggling to make ends meet right on our doorsteps. We pray that there'll be a generosity of heart that will help enable us to share what we have with those who have very little. Gracious Father, we bless your name. And we ask that the work that you have started so long ago will be continued. That you'll raise up women and men of faith and confidence who are not ashamed to declare your name and to stand in the gap for those who are not able to speak for themselves. So we ask that, Lord, as we wait upon you, as we remember what you went through, help us to know that with you all things are possible. So hear our prayers this morning and have mercy upon us and grant us wisdom and courage to give glory to your name in all our actions. For we ask these things for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Amen. Before the Reverend Dr. Sarah Hayes come and bring the word to us, we're going to listen to this wonderful song, Were You There? And if you weren't there, remind me of your name again. I do, I do apologize. Megan is going to come and sing to us, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And if, if you weren't able to transport yourself there and not able, as she sings to us this morning, then let's take that step and visualize what they did to our Lord. And rather what he allowed them to do to him for our sake.
I'm sorry for my delay in standing up. I was caught into another place at another time. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, too, for your hospitality in inviting us here. Thank you. I know Christchurch are really pleased um, to be represented by Jan, and Lottie and I are just bowled over by the welcome we've received. I know that, well, I can tell from the way that Lottie's moving that she's really excited about playing with JJ and Dixie and singing with Megan, so thank you. And I know that we've caused you some trouble this morning, Glenn, and I thank you for um, your graciousness in sort of sliding over that as if everything was smooth uh, and good. Well, it is good, but, you know. Shall we pray? Lord our God, we thank you. We just thank you for this season of Easter when in the rhythm of the year we can remember what you have done. And we thank you for this this time on Good Friday when we stop. And just as Megan has sung us into another place, and yet a place that's so real to us in our lives now, we just want to spend these next minutes reflecting on your time on the cross. Take us and teach us, Lord. Reveal something of yourself to us. Meet with us. Amen. So here we are, Good Friday, and of course the cross, the cross is the focus of our faith, isn't it? We see a cross, I'm always slightly offended when I see people wearing a cross as jewellery and words come out of their mouth that make me think um, that they have no knowledge of who our Lord and Saviour is. I find that really hard. A cross is so powerful, isn't it? because it means so much to us. And of course, the cross that we have and the crosses that you have here are empty. And in a way, we live in the shadow of the cross of three days' time, because we are privileged in the way that the disciples in this story weren't to know how this turns out. In three days' time, we will be celebrating the empty cross. For today, I'd like us just to stick with the cross of Good Friday and not get ahead of ourselves. It's hard, I think, to hold this weekend. And I've said to people at St Germain's recently, I get really grumpy in this week. I find this week really hard. And I get to sort of Maundy Thursday, yesterday, and I think, oh, I know why this week is hard. I've done the pouring out of the best, the pouring out of oil, of the perfume on Monday. And somehow I've come to betrayal. Judas's betrayal, Peter's denial of who Jesus is, that last supper. And you know, don't you, you get to now and you're bracing yourself for living through Good Friday and the laying down of everything tomorrow, that silence before those wonderful words on Sunday morning. It's a difficult week. It's a challenging week. And we've read from John's Gospel, John's account. John's, we refer to these as stories, don't we? And I think the word story somehow devalues 
what we're looking at. Really, this is an account. John was an eyewitness to this, and he wrote it down so that we could know how he saw what was happening. And, you know, I want to take us to the end of the passage that Jan read for us and just look at these few words. Jesus didn't say very much on the cross, and a lot of what we understand about what was happening here comes through Paul's writing, comes through uh, the letter to the Hebrews, and, of course, the great books of Romans and Paul's letters. But we do have some evidence here of what actually happened. And we have these last words of Jesus. It is finished. It is finished. I'm sorry, what is finished exactly? What is finished? Easter week is finished. I'm nearly over that painful week. I can start to look forward to Sunday. Mm -mm, Don't think that was what it was about. Maybe Jesus was saying, Father God, you did not take this cup from me. I did what you required of me. It is done. And I am certain that that was part of what Jesus was saying. Maybe Jesus was saying, this has been agony. And now it is over. I am about to die. And I'm sure there was something of that too. But I wonder in the rumblings of the cosmic battle between good and evil, between God and Satan, I wonder what it is that had been finished. And you know, six o'clock in the morning on Good Friday to six o'clock in the evening on that Friday, the world had changed forever. The things you could see that had happened, well, the disciples had lost a friend. They'd lost a leader. Their worlds had crashed apart. We thought we knew what was going on here. And maybe they remembered that Jesus had warned them of what would happen. Maybe in the mist and the fog of it all, they just couldn't think straight. The disciples had lost a friend and a leader. Mary had lost her son. The heartbreak, and some of us know what it is to lose a child, a family member, someone who is very precious to us. James had lost a brother. Jesus' clothes had been distributed among the people who had killed him. The people who were on watch to make sure that he was really dead had each taken part of his clothing. Simon had been made to carry a cross. Nicodemus had found an empty new tomb for the body of Jesus. Mary had lost a son and been adopted into John's household. Those are some of the visible relationship things that had happened. And there were some other visible things that had happened. A centurion had said, He was indeed the Son of God. A centurion whose job it was to crucify Jesus, who came ready for the job in hand. Because of how Jesus died and what he saw happened, he testifies, this man was innocent, the Son of God. The crowd... The crowd that came to watch the crucifixion, to watch this healer, this deliverer, this person who had taken on the authorities and lost. They came to watch him die. 
and they went home beating their breasts. They went home, we don't know, appalled, sad, distraught, distressed, humbled, embarrassed at what had happened. There came a moment when the earth was covered in darkness and when the curtain in the temple was torn. All physical things that people saw, all visible things that speak of something much deeper that was going on. What really was going on? Well, you know, if we look back in John's Gospel, right to the beginning, and how often do we read these words? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they resonate, don't they, from that first verse in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. In the beginning was God, and God created. And God goes through creation six days God spends creating and at the end of the sixth day God has finished creating and he steps back and says this is good and on the Sabbath on the seventh day he rests and of course we know that although it was good when God finished creating lots of things that were not really very good at all crept in very fast very fast indeed fast track all your knowledge through the old testament all those relationships that go wrong all those people who fight each other all those people who are devious and steal from each other the temple culture the people who think that getting the rules right is more important than justice and righteousness and true worship and we come Fast forward to Jesus. Fast forward to Jesus when the word became flesh and lived among us. God, who was there at the beginning in the form of his son Jesus, came and lived among us. Came to restore, to reconcile, to redeem came to put a stop to all of the stuff that had got in between that created perfection and this point in history. And we're good, aren't we, at thinking of us and our time and our day and our week and our life. And it's important that we do that. God is very present in each of our lives. We also know from Scripture that this Easter weekend was a punctuation mark in the whole sweep of history. In the whole sweep of history, there was something going on in this weekend, in these events of Easter. And you know, in Jesus, God begins the work of recreating, of recreating afresh. And what happened on Good Friday was that the old order was done away with. The old, marred, flawed, violent, decayed, destroyed, destructive creation that, or those things that had crept into that perfect creation was taken down by the work of Jesus on the cross. We have this, I don't know if you noticed, Um, as Jan was reading, and you probably know these passages really well. Pilate insisted, a notice was put above Jesus on the cross, Jesus the King of the Jews, and the Jews did not like it. Just say he claims to be, and Pilate said, I've written what I've written. And how true was Pilate? This is about the kingship of Jesus. This is about eternal and supreme authority finally doing away with the corruption and the decay that had crept in. And you could be forgiven for nabbing me afterwards and saying, oh yeah, right, well, when I read the news, 
when I get a phone call from a friend who's distressed, when I live some of my life, honestly, it doesn't feel much like that. I noticed as I came into your church that you have these words from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, just there. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has come anew. When we're baptised, when we confess Christ as Saviour, what we do is align ourselves to the truth that the old order has gone and that we are a new creation. And then we have the interesting challenge of living in the world where there's lots of visibility that it doesn't really feel much like that, probably most of the time. And of course we do have the privilege of knowing what happens in three days' time. So we can cheat a bit. We've got one uh, advantage over the disciples, haven't we? We are called to live as people in the new kingdom of God. And what Good Friday did is what one, um, one writer says, it kind of reduces the violence and the decay and the destruction from this vibrant life force to being like a pavement being flattened, squashed, not, not there, not a, ch not, not a challenge, and it makes us, if you like, like the flowers that are growing through the pavement. I don't know whether you think of yourself as a dandelion or um, some rather elegant cornflower. Whatever you think of yourself as, God is enabling you through the work of Jesus in Good Friday to push through the pavement to not have to have the pavement as a barrier, to encounter its hardness, but to know that because you are baptised into, you are called and rooted into being a new creation with Christ, all of those things that were part of life can be left at this Good Friday place and that we can go forward knowing that Jesus, as Jesus is risen, so we are being called to grow up through this hard place. The old things have gone and the new things are coming. And going back to those first words from John's Gospel, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. We read those words at Christmas, don't we? We get to Easter and we've kind of forgotten them. But it's the truth of Easter, isn't it, that is foreshadowed in Christmas. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. There is a new creation. We, are, we have life in Christ as newly created people through Good Friday. And there is nothing about the old order that can defeat the new creation which is being grown up through Jesus. And of course we have choices. We have choices as to whether we stay in that old created place and we align ourselves with the violence and the darkness, the defeatism, even the, well, that's how it is. That's not what it is to be part of this new creation. You know, somebody called Tom Wright talks about Good Friday as the day the revolution began. The day when everything that was old was squashed and held down forever and Jesus had defeated it. And so we can live in the certain knowledge that we are drawn towards new life, that the kingdom of God started invading the earth on Good Friday and that we are part of that revolution. That's our choice. Be part of a revolutionary movement where Jesus is Lord and King and able to transform us, to enable us to live our lives, to deal with the stuff and to be flowers that come through the pavement. 
Lord, we want to make choices for you all of the time. We just want to make choices for you. We thank you that we are redeemed. We thank you for everything that we can leave at the cross that is done for. And we stand on this Good Friday day with confidence that you have defeated all that is rotten and wrong with the world and that you bring in a new order. And as newly created people, we want to stand with you and we want to ask that you would continue your work of transforming in us. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. As we bring our time together to a close, we're going to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I ask Lottie to come with musicians to come and lead us. Let us stand as we, we join together, rather. You can hum how you, as we, we conclude this. such 
shares with our world in his dying moments, to the power he imparts to those who will only come and receive, to the hope that is ours. And so, Lord, we pray that as we go from this time of remembering and thanksgiving, that you will remind us that you have given us your spirit to live the life to which you have called us so that those who are living in darkness will see the light and come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We ask that you would draw those who are on the periphery closer to you. For those who have been walking without any true purpose, that we will begin to move according to your spirit so that your kingdom will be established here on earth and men and women, boys and girls will come to find you as a personal savior. Hear our prayer and have mercy upon us for we ask all these things for your glory and your kingdom's sake. Amen. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you.